I'm honored to be here today. How about you guys? Yes. Remember the things that the Lord has done for us. Um, in, in case you're not familiar with who we are, we're Grace Bible Fellowship, so that's right there. <laughs> we are a Bible teaching church. We believe that every word in the 66 books that we will be going through, if we get through them all, are inspired by God, given to the holy man of old that wrote as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. And we believe that every word is important, every number is important, that it's all inspired by God. And through the study of it, we get to know who he is better and who we are and how we should be toward him. Amen? Amen. So that's what we're here to do. And it amazes me that there are churches that don't do that. I don't have enough of a personality that I can just stand up here and pontificate on one verse and just fill the air with words that will keep anyone interested. So I am grateful that we have the Word of God, which gives us direction and clarity and inspiration. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here, the very fact that we can be in a, in a warm place on a cold day, the fact that we have those like-minded brothers and sisters beside us, that we look to you, Lord, to teach us, to educate us, to make us more like you. So, Lord, we put our hearts before you. We put our minds toward you. We set our eyes upon your word and pray that you might do that which is pleasing to you and us. So, Lord, we're here. We dedicate this time to you. Pray that you might move us, inspire us, change us, help us. You know the struggles that we have. You know the distractions. And I pray that you might settle us before you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I know it's a week before Christmas. Yeah, there's the misery sound. There it is. Oh, goody. Yes. Uh, how many of you have lots to do? Only a few. That's wow. That's great. How many of you really have lots to do? Really? Only a few. Wow, you guys are so awesome. I have a million things to do. But the most important thing I'm going to do right now. Well, here we are. We're in Genesis chapter 18, and we're going to go through the entire chapter as we've been looking at the life of Abraham and God calling him out of Ur of the Chaldees and bringing him through uh, all of these tests that he's been brought through. We can kind of see a reflection of ourselves in the things that Abraham goes through. So, as we go through, I'll just remind you, and we were starting in chapter 12, the, the test of family ties. He says, leave everything. Leave your kindred, your land, and go to a place that I'll show you. And he takes his father and he takes his nephew and probably everything that he owned and takes it with him and goes upstream. Once he gets there, his father dies and he goes to Canaan. Then once he goes to Canaan, where God has called him and told him to go, there's a famine. Well, that's great. Thanks so much, God. You brought me to this place, and now there's a famine. So they decide, well, what we need to do is go to Egypt. And they go to Egypt, and he has to lie about his wife. And you guys know the story. I'm just reminding you. And then he and Lot, because they have so much stuff after going back to Canaan, they have to separate. God caused this holy dissatisfaction, this rub which caused them to go in separate directions, which tells me sometimes you have conflict and it's designed by God to move you somewhere. Maybe you came here. Or maybe you're going to move from here. Maybe my shirt disturbs you. <laughs> it's the same color as Marbu, but I don't look as good in it. We see in chapter 14, Abram has to go and deliver his nephew Lot from Sodom because a bunch of kings from the north have come and taken over these cities and taken all their stuff. And with 318 of his own men, armed men in his household, boy, there's some security for you, goes and delivers Lot and all of their stuff. And he meets this character, Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, the priest of the most high God. It's interesting. And he brings bread and wine, rather interesting, a very uh, interesting picture of who Jesus Christ eventually comes to be in fruition. We see a shadow of that in Melchizedek as he comes and gives uh, Abram courage. He cuts a covenant with Abram 
And Abram isn't the one who goes through and actually signs on the dotted line. God makes a unilateral covenant with Abram. And why is that important? Because there are covenants where the two parties have to agree. And then there are covenants where God says, I'm going to do this and it doesn't matter how messed up you are. Which one are you in? The one that I'm in right now is unconditional because it's based upon what the work of Jesus Christ has already been done on the cross. But to get there, I had to do something. I had to stop running. And I had to believe. And so that's all we do as Christians is stop running. We talked about Sarai and Hagar. God gave a promise to Abram, you are going to have a son in your old age. Sarai waning in her uh, belief of that said, well, maybe he didn't mean me. Maybe he meant someone else. Like, how about my maid? And gives her maid as a wife to Abram, which is not how you should ever get a wife from your wife. <laughs> and it's interesting because when God addresses her later on, he doesn't address her as Abram's wife. He addresses her as Sarah's maidservant. God doesn't recognize the marriage. And he also doesn't recognize the fruit of that marriage. And we'll see that when we get to it. And so last week, we looked at the sign of the covenant, which was so uncomfortable for me to talk about circumcision in front of all of you. And in good taste, they were quiet. And God says, what I want you to do is make a covenant with me, and I need you to take the most sensitive male part that is on you and slice it and remove the flesh from it. It's rather interesting. It happens on the tail end of his miscalculation in getting a second wife. And he says, what I want you to do is start by getting circumcised. And all of the men in your household, which at 99 or whatever age it is, I'm sure it was a memorable experience. <laughs> God reveals himself as El Shaddai. And we talked about God revealing himself in his various names, and this is one that he says, and it's God Almighty. That's the way he that identifies himself, and he declares him, instead of Abram, you will be Abraham. There's that in there, which is a he in the Hebrew, and Sarai will not be Sarai anymore. She'll be Sarah. So he's adding a breath to them, and we talked about what that means in the New Testament and the Greek. And he tells him, you're going to be fruitful and you're going to have children. And he reiterates the covenant that it's through your wife. You're going to have this child. It's not the way you thought it would be. But he tells him that it will be for his descendants. And all of this land, this 300,000 square miles of property, which Israel has never fully taken occupation of, they've only owned about 10% of it. And it's even less now. God said, this is all your land. I'm declaring it yours and for your ancestors. It's interesting that there's a lot of undeclared land that they didn't take over yet. And so he declares what circumcision is. And he says, that's what I want you to do. By the way, this is not the first time circumcision has been introduced to human history. There were other nations who would do this for other reasons, uh, hygienic and other reasons, which I won't get into. And so imagine God tells you, I want you to do this. That's uncomfortable. And so using Legos, <laughs> he says, it's everyone, anyone who's in your house, anyone who's been bought, in other words, servants, slaves, anybody that you have anything to do with, everybody needs to get this done. It's not something that's just for you and for your, uh, your heirs. It's for everyone under your roof which is a rather interesting thing. You would think Israel would make a bigger deal of that, but they don't. And it happens when you're eight days old, which is when vitamin K is at its peak, and God knew. So he says, you're going to have a child through Sarai, and you're going to have so many children that are going to be kings that come from you, which is a rather interesting way to say something. Kings will come out of you. I've never had that come out of me before. But Sarai, who's 90 years old, and Abram, who's 99, he rounds up to about 100. It's, it's, they're well past the age of bearing children. And why does God wait so long? 
because I think he muses in the fact that he waits until there's absolutely no ability in us to do anything. He does it all. Okay, you're, you're done. You're finished trying yourself. Good, good. I can finally get in there and get something done uh, for my cause. So Abraham immediately moved to action, takes charge, and circumcises everyone, including Ishmael, including every male in his household. And so they line up that day, and I'm sure it was a bloody mess. And of course, there is some recuperation time, which is needed. So bed rest is definitely recommended. We looked at the various scriptures where God's focus was not on the physical act of that thing. It was about the heart. And everything that happens on the outside, God is much more concerned about what's going on on the inside. That the flesh, those natural propensities of our sinful nature, that they would be cut off from us so that we might live in a new sensitivity towards the things of God, uh, putting it delicately. And so God is concerned about the heart and the circumcision of the heart where we don't have a will to do something against God's will or even something just for ourselves, but that our entire heart has been given over to him and is sensitive to him. Make sense? If you were here last week, it should have made sense then. Maybe it doesn't now. So this week, we're going to look at Abraham who has three visitors and we're going to take a look at his He's, he's basically meeting with God, and we'll take a look at that. And of course, he's living by the terebinth tree, which uh, we've seen previously. In verse 1 of chapter 18, Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of memory as he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. So this is kind of, a, it's kind of the headline, if you will. So he lifted his eyes and he looked and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and he bowed himself to the ground. Now, I know you're going to have relatives come over for Christmas probably, or maybe you'll be a relative that's showing up at somebody's house. This is a rather interesting reaction, don't you think? Running out and bowing down to strangers who... You haven't seen, or has he? People you don't recognize, or does he? The Lord appeared, it says, and it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which is Yahweh or Jehovah, whichever one you might be familiar with, the Tetragrammatron. Uh, anyway, the Lord appeared to him, and he lifts up his eyes, and there they are. Abram, Abraham is sitting in his tent, presumably in the heat of the day. He's under shade, which is where you should be in the heat of the day, especially if you're older like Abraham, and especially if you're recovering from an operation. And so he's there in the heat of the day, which is rather interesting. I notice that the Lord sometimes comes to us in the heat of the day, doesn't he? In the middle of the most difficult part of your life. Sometimes it's designed that way. And he saw them and he ran. Now, he's 99 years old. You ever see a 99-year-old man run? <laughs> Especially after freshly being circumcised. You have to get the picture. See, I think when we read the scriptures, we just go, blah, 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 blah. And we don't think but here's a 99-year-old man who rises to his feet and runs after a rather traumatic operation. And he's 99. Why? It's interesting. There's another story in the New Testament that Jesus tells about the lost son, the prodigal son. And it's the father who runs to go meet the son. Here, it's actually the son going to meet the father who does the running, and Abram's the son. It's rather interesting. And he bows to the ground. He's flat on his face. You don't normally do that to people that you love. Normally you reach out and hug them, right? Or something of that nature. This is a deep reverence for three that he does not really know. Or does he? And so 
and they're just standing there. It doesn't say they walk up to the tent. It says that he looks up and they're just standing there. That's weird. They're just standing there, waiting to be recognized. And who goes to whom? Abraham runs to them. You ever wonder why God doesn't come and meet you where you are? Maybe he wants you to meet where he is. Just thinking out loud. And so, Abraham says, my Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts and that you may pass by in as much as you have come to your servant. And they said, do as you've said. It's interesting to just stand there. Abraham runs out and he's got a whole day planned. Why don't you come in? I'll wash your feet, get you something to eat. You can sit under the tree. He, he knows where they're going to be, what they're going to do. How, you know, he's got it all figured out. And what do they say in response? Okay. <laughs> they show up. He, he just starts talking. You ever do that when you get nervous? You know, you meet some famous person, you go, oh, oh, hi, hi, oh, oh, so nice to meet you. I, I've seen all your movies, and, and uh, I really like that one part. We just see, you remember that? Oh, of course you remember that. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you ever get that way. No, you guys, no, <laughs> never, of course. You know, the God of heaven, why would you be flabbergasted at some human being? He says, please do not pass by your servant. Now, I want to tell you, one of these is a theophany. One of these is the L-O-R-D. Or it wouldn't be written that he's the L-O-R-D. We've got two angels and a pre-appearing of Jesus Christ. Because the scripture says he meets with the L-O-R-D. That's why he's on his face. That's why he's nervous. Because he recognizes one. This is the fifth time that God has come and spoken to him. This is the first time we're told it's bodily, which is rather interesting. So he says, don't pass by your servant. Let me serve you. You know, we don't, we don't normally think that way. You know, like if somebody calls you, you go, hello, what do you want? Who is this? You know, we ask questions that we require them to, to give information, right? You don't get on the phone and say, hi, this is Buddy. What's your favorite color? You know, we don't, we don't forward information when we pick up the phone and we don't know who we're talking to. Abraham just gushes, which tells me there's, there's recognition here. So let me serve you. He says, you have come to me. He says, stay for a while, rest. Let me make you some food. Let me serve you. What an incredible bit of hospitality. That's some radical hospitality, right? Hey, you've come to my house. Grab the mailman, yank him inside one day and say, listen, have a seat. Let me put a program on for you. Uh, let me get you some iced tea. You know, like, it's a little overwhelming. But this is radical hospitality, and this kind of hospitality is still shown in the Middle East because it's preserved for us here in the scriptures, and we see what it looks like. In Hebrews 13, 2, we're told, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so, doing, by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. The writer of Hebrews is referring back to this incident, if I'm not mistaken. One of the requirements for somebody to be a pastor or an elder is that they be a lover of strangers. They practice hospitality. It's something I think that we do uniquely well here in this church to the point where I can't get you all to sit down. And strangers are like, yeah, hi, 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 what's your name, your name, your name, your name? Oh, I, I can't remember all these names, hi. I'm, I'm looking for a stranger. Kevin! Kevin, your first time here. 
Didn't know you'd be singled out and embarrassed today. But you know, it looks like you can handle it. Your skin's thick from, from frequent beatings. So that's good. You're, you're good here. Anybody say hello to you? Everyone. Yeah. Sorry about that. But see, the scripture talks about radical hospitality, and that's the, that's the kind of people we are. Hey, I don't know you. How come? Where'd you come from? That's the way it should be. So, sorry, Kevin, but thanks, guys. Don't forget to entertain strangers, because by doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. And after Abram babbles off, Abraham babbles off at the mouth and says all this, they say, okay. That's it. You know, just do what you've said. Okay. They're very few words, these strangers. It's interesting. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, make ready three measures of meal. Knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd. He took a tender and good calf and he gave it to a young man and he hastened to prepare it. And he took butter and milk and the calf in which he had prepared, and he set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. That's a little creepy. And then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? Apparently they know her. And so he said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall, be, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the door, which was behind him. That's a whole lot of information. First of all, I want you to recognize that these three measures of meal, you don't understand, but this is 22 quarts of material. 22 quarts. Hey, honey, we got some strangers over. Like you to make some prime rib. And, you know, 50 loaves of bread. Get on it, babe. I'm not sure my wife would take it very kindly. I want you to take 22 quarts of meal and make, start making bread. Just start popping them out. I'll let you know when to quit. Make these little pizzas, these little flat pitas. I, I don't know. This is 22 quarts of meal. And, oh, by the way, this is the history of what's called a fellowship offering later on in, in the law. A fellowship offering is three measures of meal, and this is where it originates, because they're having fellowship. Number two, this is not fast food. So not only does she have to get all this together and bake this food, but he goes and he grabs a young calf, and he gives it to a young man, and he says, here, butcher this thing. And so... They butcher this animal up as quickly as possible, presumably to throw it on the barbie. So they're going to have some barbecue. This is not fast food. This is going to be a while. Can you imagine? Hey, come over for dinner. What time do you want us to come over? Four o'clock. When are we eating? Nine. <laughs> it's a lot of work. You're going to get some good fresh meat, though, because it's, you know, fresh. This is not fast food. And number two, this is not a kosher meal. He gave them meat and butter and milk oh, and bread. This is not a kosher meal. Aye. The Lord and the angels, they didn't eat kosher. Abraham made it. It's not a kosher meal. Well, if you think it's kosher, it's about as kosher as a cheeseburger with bacon on it. <laughs> you see, the rabbis have determined when the Lord says, do not boil a kid in his mother's milk, that it means that you shouldn't mix meat and milk. This was a secular practice. It was something that they used in the worship of demonic deities, and it was a, a disgusting thing to do. And so they said, don't do this. God wasn't saying you can't have a cheeseburger but that's what they've interpreted it as. Except if you look to the progenitor of all the Jews, he made a non-kosher meal. I guess it's okay. If the Lord and angels could eat it, I think you can too. 
the bacon. Okay, maybe you got a problem. <laughs> and then you've got Sarah who's listening at the tent. Ladies, you never do this, right? Yeah, they call it eavesdropping for a reason. It's never Adam's dropping. It's always Eve's <laughs> dropping. <laughs> Just trying to keep you awake. So she's listening by the tent to all these things that are going on. You know, my, my wife doesn't miss too much. She knows what's going on. Yeah. But she doesn't eavesdrop anymore. If I'm on the phone, she just like comes up and looks at me. <laughs> and she goes, who is it? <laughs> it's John Colbeth. And then she's like, oh, okay. And then she walks away. <laughs> if I told her it was a girl, she'd stay there. I don't know why, but it's okay. So she's eavesdropping, and there's Abraham. He's all done. He's, you know, he's got the bread going. He's got the meat happening. He's got, you know, they're, they're all eating, and, and he's just standing there watching them eat. You ever have someone stand over you while you eat? One of the only times that's memorable to me is in the military. If you take too many breaths between forkfuls, you lose your plate. I don't think that's what was going on, but it's a little nerve wracking, you know, to be just, you know, just, you know, you're looking around because you don't want to, you've got your thumb on the plate, you know, because you don't want to lose it. But there's Abraham standing underneath this tree watching them eat. Interesting. You think he's nervous? I think he's nervous. He didn't sit down and eat with him. I find that interesting. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age. You see, old is what you say. It sounds negative. Well advanced in age is what happens with Parmesan. <laughs> so you kind of have both sides. And Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Well, no kidding. She's 90. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself. Wow, this happened once before, just a chapter ago. It was Abraham who laughed within himself when the Lord came and said, you're going to have a son and his name will be Isaac, which means he laughed. And now she's laughing. She said to herself, have I grown old and I have the pleasure of the Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, surely I... Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. not one having an aversion for conflict. No, you laughed. But she laughed in her heart. Isn't that interesting? Abraham also laughed in his heart. But what he said later was, oh, Ishmael, if you could only bless Ishmael. That was what was on his heart. What was on Sarah's heart was, what, are you kidding me? After all this, after all these years, by the way, it's been 23 years between the time God first came to him and told him this would happen to now. That's a long time to wait for God to do something. Wouldn't you think? Yeah. It's a long time to wait. So, Sarah being old, that, that's the nicest picture I could think to put up. She actually doesn't believe it. And it's interesting, he's asked, hey, where's your, where's your wife? He goes, oh, she's in the tent. He didn't say, oh, that's not my wife, it's my sister. <laughs> he flat out comes out and he's honest. And I, I don't know if that was a test of his honesty or not. But he says she's in the tent. And so within earshot of her hearing, the one says, hey, you're going to have a child. And she laughs in her heart. And he goes, why did she laugh? Abraham can't hear what she's doing in her heart, right? He's like, oh, she laughed? I didn't hear anything. But I believe it could be true. I, I laughed when I first heard it. 
And then when she's questioned, say, why did you laugh? Oh, I didn't laugh. Oh, yeah, you did. You know, it's amazing the lies that we tell ourselves and sometimes believe. And God knows. God knows. We don't need, we don't need to lie. You know, most people lie because they're afraid. They're afraid to tell the truth. They're afraid of how someone will receive them. They're afraid that somebody won't like them. They're afraid that the truth will hurt someone or they're afraid that it will look bad for them. It's fear-based. There's no faith in that. It's interesting. No, you did laugh. And then the men rose from there and looked toward Sodom. They've got business. And Abraham went with them to send them on their way. And the Lord said, the L-O-R-D said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and the nations of the earth shall be blessed by him. God is contemplating being intimate with Abraham and letting him in on a secret. The three that had come to him in human form is none other than a pre-appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ and two angels. The two angels are on a military mission. They're on their way down to Sodom because they're about to do some judgment and pour down some judgment on Sodom. And the Lord is considering being intimate with Abraham and saying, should, should I tell Abraham what's going on? I mean, he's kind of a big deal and he's going to have these nations and peoples after him. And yeah, I think I'd like to be intimate with Abraham and let him in on a secret. Has the Lord ever told you a secret? I think he's told you all a secret. I think there's a mystery in which you now understand that you never understood before. I think you know the secret to eternal life. I think you understand the, the full depth of human nature. I think you understand that everyone needs a savior because all sin and fall short of the glory of God. These are mysteries to most people. They go to college for you know 17 years and they come out and don't know any more than they did when they went in but you know it because it's very well uh, chronologized for us in the scriptures. So these three people, these three men, by the way, always angels are men. There's no female angel name ever given. And there's no little children with little bows and arrows. That's Hallmark. That's you're thinking of something else. And so he's, contemplating being intimate. Why did the Lord consider sharing his plan of action with Abraham? It says right here in the text, because he's going to pass this on. The question is, why does the Lord consider sharing his plan of action with you? I'm going to postulate something. If God tells you something, it's not just for you. In fact, sometimes God will tell you something that isn't for you at all. Sometimes there are things that you go through so that you have an understanding of what it's like to go through that so that when someone else goes through that, you have compassion where you wouldn't have before. I have compassion on people who are drug addicts because I used to be one. I have compassion on people that have addiction issues, whether it be sexual addiction, anger, whatever it is, I have compassion on them instead of being judgmental because I was that guy. I came up in a home where my father and mother got divorced very early and had bitter fights. And I wonder why did God let me go through that? And then I read the scripture that says, I am able to give comfort to those with whom the same kind of comfort where God gave me comfort. Corinthians chapter one. So there are things that God wants to share with us and sometimes it's through the things that we go through. And he wants to share it with us so we don't keep it to ourselves. Lessons are definitely something we need to learn first, but then you just don't keep them to yourself. We have an obligation to hand it off, don't we? And the reason I say that is because it says here, for I have known him. 
in order that he may command his children and his household after him. Notice, sharing. That they keep the way of the Lord and do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. I think we tell Abraham so he can tell everybody else. So why does the Lord tell you anything? To share it with everybody else. Once you fully learn it yourself, once you understand it. Like being the farmer who deserves in the first fruits and he must eat of the first fruits first. We need to understand the scriptures and understand God who he is so that we can explain it to other people. But sometimes it just goes into our head and we spit it out of our mouths and it's always inauthentic because we don't know it, really know it. So he's going to hear it from God and with the understanding, he's going to hand it off. Matthew 5, 13, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how will it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and they put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, Jesus saved me so that I could know him and number two, share him. If Jesus has saved you, it's so that you might know him and share him. The salt of the earth means you are the preservative of the earth. You're that which gives the, gives the food flavor. You're that element which has this preservative effect. In fact, we're going to see in Sodom, the angels can't bring any destruction on Sodom until the righteous have been delivered because they're the preservative of that town. Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. You're what gives this life flavor. You. Yeah, you. Hard to believe, isn't it? I think it is. It's like a mailman that has all the mail but never delivers it. <laughs> that, that would be silly. That would, that would become a bad back, wouldn't it? You see, you have news. You have information critical to the eternal life of other people. How do you not deliver that? I want you to notice a principle I see. Information, revelation, and its accumulation is given for communication. Now, I'm sure some of you will memorize that. It took me a while in the midnight hours to put it together. Information, revelation, and accumulation of it is not just for the storing up of the stuff, like, like being a hoarder. It's for communication. It's for giving away. Well, Pastor Dave, it's easy for you to say you're a pastor, and sure, you're, you, know, you, you get to gobble up all this stuff and read all these books, and then you spit it out on all of us. Well, you guys are no different than me. You just have a different audience. And each one of you has a different audience than I have. And there are people that you'll be able to reach that I won't be able to. It's not the accumulation of information and revelation. It's not this accumulation so that you can be smarter than everyone else in the room. It's so that you might be more helpful to everyone else in the room. Does that make sense? And God is now sharing with Abraham what's happening so that he's going to pass it down and it begins with your household, the people under your roof and the people that will come after them. What a great privilege and opportunity we have when there are people in our lives when we can share with them the truths of God. And I can tell you that window will be open and it eventually will close. And that opportunity will be no more. Matthew 25, 29, Jesus says, for to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. It's a bit mysterious. And then in Mark 4, 24, 
Then he said to them, this is Jesus, take heed that you, of what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. Here's the principle. The more you use what God gives you, the more God will give you. If you wonder, why isn't it I, ha I haven't heard anything from God recently? I mean, I read and read and read and read and read and read and read. Well, you might be a little plugged up. Maybe God can't pour anything more into you because you need to empty out of some of those things that he's already given to you. Why give you new revelation, new information if you haven't shared it with other people? This is a promise that God will stop talking to you if you don't share it. Wow. A little like the Dead Sea. You know, the Dead Sea always has fresh water flowing into it. But instead of having an outlet, it evaporates. And the Dead Sea is shrinking at an alarming rate, actually. You can find articles on it. It's shrinking at this incredibly alarming rate and leaving plains of salt and mineral. In fact, it's a serious concern in the Middle East. And there are rivers that are drying up. It's because they don't, there, there's, there's plenty of input, but there's no output. So what happens is it just evaporates. I don't want to be like the Dead Sea. I want to be like the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee, which sits considerably north of the Dead Sea, has the mountains that melt and all the water comes down and fills the Sea of Galilee. It's full of life. And it leads to the Jordan River, which comes down to the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is dead, except for where the fresh water's coming in. It's the only place where there's life. So any of you who are afraid of crabs, fish, you know, sharks, which don't live there, but you know, Jaws makes an impression on someone's psyche. You can go into the Dead Sea and there's nothing alive there. Don't be like the Dead Sea. Be the Sea of Galilee. As God shows you and gives you information and revelation, don't just make an accumulation make sure that it's accompanied by communication. Amen? Amen. You're also very quiet today. In verse 20, and the Lord said, because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come against me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and they went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. You see, two out of the three that were on a military mission took off. One remained behind, who is the L-O-R-D. And he continues having a conversation. Imagine, you're going to have a conversation and he says, this is what's going to happen, guys. I'm going down to Sodom and Gomorrah. There's trouble there. I'm about to bring judgment on them. I want to go see what it's like. Now, Abraham's got people in that city, right? Mm -hmm. Lot, his wife, and his daughters. And he's been there before and delivered them before. And now judgment is coming. And he's telling Abraham about it. Do you think the Lord knows what's coming out of Abraham? Or do you think it's a test? This is a test. It's interesting. And Abraham came near and said, would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? It's a serious theological question. Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Okay, he's postulating. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Do you notice the, inf the, the inflection in this? Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. So Abraham, with some zeal, I'm sure, says, what are you kidding me? You're gonna destroy that place? If, what, what if there's 50 righteous people there? You're going to kill them too? Do you think that's an acceptable, you know, uh, loss? And the Lord, L-O-R-D, of all the earth, 
He says, certainly you would never do that. And he goes, if I find 50, I won't destroy for the sake of the 50. Interesting. Is God unrighteous? That's an accusation in which he gets all the time. He gets a really bad rap. Anything hard or difficult happens to you. I don't know about you, but I have this saying. Like if I try to put my key in the, in the door of my car and I drop my keys, I'm like, oh, gee, I got to bend down. And it's getting harder to do. And I do it a second time and it falls. I'm like, really? <laughs> and without knowing it, I'm actually mad at God for a minute. But then I realize I'm just mad at me because I'm a dope and I drop things. God gets the hit for all the evil in the world. In fact, in the insurance world, they call it acts of God. I'm serious. Look it up. Tornadoes and you're not insured against any of that stuff. That's acts of God. We can't help you with any cash today because God was involved. But would God destroy the righteous with the wicked? That's a great question. This is a serious theological nugget right here. No, he won't. So in Luke 11, verses 5 to 8, this is Jesus teaching. Which of you have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, Lend me three loaves. I, 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 I've never done this. For a friend of mine has come to me on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door's shut. My children are with me in bed. By the way, they used to do that. It was a family bed and everybody slept together to conserve energy. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, Yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Jesus says, human beings are like this. If you nag them enough, they'll give you what you want. Perhaps you've seen this. The insistent child in, this, in the grocery store that says, mine, mine, mine. And it's a bag full of lollipops. And mom's like, no, no, no. And eventually says, all right. You see, human beings don't like to be irritated. And Jesus says, even people will yield to someone who's persistent. But God is certainly not a person where he would get frustrated with hearing you pray or ask questions. And notice, he gets an answer straight away, and it's a straight answer. If I find 50 in the city... I will not destroy the city for the sake of the 50. In other words, evil will continue to reign because I have people there who would get destroyed. Imagine that. This is a very serious theological issue. And then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now I am but dust and ashes and have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than 50 righteous. Would you destroy the city for a lack of five? And he said, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, suppose that there be 40 found there. And so he said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. Abraham is haggling. Don't you know this haggling thing? Have you never heard of haggling? Hey. 50. If there's 50, would you do it? No. He went, what if there's five less? Would you destroy for five less? Is that what you do? Would you take 20% off? <laughs> Can I get a better deal here? That's what he's doing. He's haggling. So, you ever haggle with God? Hey, God, if you get me out of this one, I'll become a monk. I'll. <laughs> you ever haggle with God? He doesn't normally do business, but that's not, not really what this is. He's disclosing to him his heart. He's disclosing to him what he finds important. And he finds five less lives important enough to save the entire city. 
Abraham has a compassionate persistence before the Lord. Oh, that I had a friend like Abraham who would beseech God in prayer like Abraham beseeches the Lord. This is the kind of person you want praying for you, right? Who says, Lord, you got to speak to the pastor. He's got to do better. My God, he's killing me. You know, yeah, I want you to be persistent with the Lord that he pours out his spirit so I don't bore the heck out of you. Absolutely, and you should be persistent before the Lord. Luke 18, 1 to 8 says this. And then he spoke a parable to them, this is Jesus, that men ought to pray and not lose heart. The intent of God, uh, of Jesus, and why he taught what he did is put in the very first verse. So you know the purpose of the parable. Verse 2, saying... There was a certain city, a judge, who did not fear God or regard man. Now, there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, though I do not fear God or regard men, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. People get bothered. And then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? What's your prayer life like? Hey, I'll pray for you. Hey, Lord, that thing, take care of that for whoever that person's name is. Amen. Yeah, I prayed for you. I, I've got to tell you, sometimes I pray like that. But when I see Abraham and his persistence, and he really wants to know, God, where's the line here? Where are you going to draw the line? And he's persistent. The Lord doesn't get impatient or uncomfortable or go to give him the backhand. He answers him consistently, the same answer all the time. I love that about God. He's not like my earthly father. He's not like your earthly father. He is so much better than that. Amen. Although sometimes we put him in that mold. And then he said, let not the Lord be angry, for I will speak. Suppose 30 be found there. So now he's taken 10 off at a shot. So he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, indeed, now I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. And he said, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak but once more. Now, some people say this and they really don't mean it. <laughs> suppose 10, suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. Now, he just put the nail, the last nail in. He says, this is the last time. And the Lord said, I won't destroy it for the sake of 10 righteous in the city. If Abraham continued, what number do you think they would finish at? I'm leading the audience, yes. Yes. And we see, we're going to see when we get to Sodom, he delivers Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. The wife falls because she turns around. The two daughters I would not call righteous. And the only person is really Lot. God does not show judgment on this earth because of you and me. But when we're gone, he will. They say there's no such thing as a rapture in the scripture. I see it with Noah. Amen. The Lord took Noah and eight total, put them in the ark, closed the door himself, poured out rain, and raised them up and preserved them from judgment. We're going to see with Sodom, he does the same thing. This principle is hugely important, and I don't think I'm reading into it. This is what God tells us about his heart. He will not punish his children for the sins of this world. He already did in the person of his son. That's right. Double jeopardy. 
In Luke 11, verses 9 to 13, Jesus says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And to he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, Jesus said that we're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The disclosure of God's heart is that he loves you so much more than a father loves a son. And if your son says, listen, I'm hungry, give me, give me some bread. You're going to give him a rock as a joke? Say, here, gnaw on this? Then why would God? Although sometimes we think that's the way he is. He plays these cruel jokes. You ask for a fish, he gives you a serpent. Or you ask for an egg, and he gives you a scorpion. That's your earthly father, maybe. Not our heavenly father. And he says... Ask. Actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's in the continual sense, which is keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. It's a call to persistence. And the last verse, so the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham. The Lord went away. The capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D went away as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. So Abraham has three visitors appearing human in form. Two of them we know to be angels, and we're going to see them later on, and one of them is the Lord. And Abraham then walks away once he has his answer, and he can only trust that God's judgment will be righteous. So a couple of things from the New Testament. Matthew 24, 36 to 42. But on that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but my Father only. He's talking about his second coming. But as the days of Noah were, so also the coming of the Son of Man will be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. And then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding in the mill. One will be taken and the other be left. Therefore, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. We're given a very strict warning that no one knows the day or the hour when the Lord's coming. So we should be ready at any moment. It's this ever expectant return of Jesus Christ we should be living with, this imminent return. In Luke 17, verses 26 to 30. And as it was in the day of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate and they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate and drank and bought and sold and they planted, they built. And on that day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. You see, the Lord is going to take us home and then pour out judgment on the earth. It's clear. Now, I know not everyone sees this. That's okay. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, Then the Lord knows how to deliver godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. God knows how to deliver you. He knows how to take you out of the way so the judgment doesn't fall on you. And he knows how to preserve those who deserve judgment for judgment. In a world when you look around and we've got woke world, we've got LGBTQ world, we've got injustice happening everywhere, Know that there's a God in heaven who sees and knows, and he is able to deliver judgment. 
Don't fret. God sees and God knows. And in his time, when the last person that's supposed to ends up receiving Christ as their Savior, the Lord's going to gather up all his marbles and he's going to pour out his judgment. Amen. Be ready. Because we are nearer now than when we first believed, as the Scripture says. Next week, really? It's Christmas, okay? <laughs> Next week is Christmas. We have a Christmas Eve service at 7. Would love to see you here. We have a Christmas Day service on Sunday at 10 o'clock, like we always do. I hope you guys can be here. Um, I'm going to try to make it. Let's pray as the worship team comes up. Father, I thank you for your love and your intimacy that you have with us as your people, as your children. I thank you, Lord, for the lesson of Abraham and the theology that's disclosed, the knowledge of how you behave with us, your heart's intention for love, for good and not for evil, for a future and a hope for us. I pray that you might help us, Lord, to look to you that we wouldn't have to be caught up in the things of this world and so very solidly attached. But Lord, you'd help us to hold all things with an open hand before you. I pray that you might fortify and strengthen us, Lord, with information, its accumulation, and revelation so that we might share it with others. Help us, Lord, to learn and digest well so that we might be of use to you. Guide us, Lord, as we go into the Christmas season, that our heart might be sensitive to you, that we wouldn't get carried away with the frivolity and the emptiness of it, but that we would truly consecrate ourselves to you in this time, that we might use it as an opportunity to bring you glory. Help us, Lord, not to get cynical. Help us to redeem the day. In Jesus' name. Amen.